Let me turn this over to you. Somebody asked me a question about one of these bullets you've seen here, and let's talk about that. There's really lots of interesting things here. I have a question, but not on anything I'm looking at besides you. Do we know what the parent bullet is evolutionarily? I mean, did they evolve from something that looked like it had tubes, or did they evolve from something that was supinate, which feels like it's more primitive, but I'm yeah, right. More sizing, so that's the question. So big, uh, big questions about evolution are fantastic, and I recommend that you do when, when whenever you approach a big question about evolution, uh, you do that late night at a bar with a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> but to answer your question, the basal lineage of Bolitaceae is over there, the Capitolaceae, and uh, some of the crust fungi. Uh, I can't remember right now the basal crust fungi, but all of these modern versions of the ectomycorrhizal horde fleshy fungi come from wood decay fungi. And in general, throughout the whole fungal kingdom, ectomycorrhizal uh, fungi came from wood decay fungi, and that happened uh, when plant species differentiated from gymnosperms, the conifers, into the angiosperms, the flowering plants. So fungi followed plants around the world, and at first the fungi attacked the plants and the trees and the roots, and then at some point the roots said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you get a little closer. And the fungi said, well, maybe I won't attack you. And so that ectomycorrhizal association arose over a long period of time. But you can trace that sort of evolution by studying how the fungus and the plant root or the tree root interact with each other. They have a whole signaling process back and forth to, to decide whether or not it's going to happen, that fungus interaction is going to happen. I'll talk just a second or two, three, four seconds about ectomycorrhizal fungi. So when we have Boletus bicolor in the forest, right? Hundreds of them fruiting at the same time, and those spores are drifting, and they're landing on the forest floor, and conditions are good, one of those spores germinates, and a little mycelium starts growing underground. And millions of other spores germinate, and they're growing underground, and the two spore and the two mycelium underground, they meet each other. The same thing happens. They have to decide, they have that getting to know you period, right? If they do get to know each other and they're compatible mating strains, then they fuse and they form a new mycelium that has two nuclei for every cell. So that's the kind of mycelium that can make a mushroom. But with ectomycorrhizal fungi, they don't go around and make mushrooms. They go searching for tree roots. Dicaryotic mycelium of ectomycorrhizal fungi are a search party. They go out into the substrate, whatever it is, looking for a place to live. And that's a tree root in general. Mushrooms don't come from the soil. They come from tree roots. At least these mushrooms right here, ectomycorrhizal fungi like the boletes, the rusula, the cordonarii, for the most part, all the aminators, they come from tree roots. When a tree root gets colonized by the mycelium from these things, it forms a sheath over the root, and then parts of the hyphae from that sheath, they go in between the cells. That's the ectomycorrhizal lifestyle. After a while, when conditions are good, and usually, in the summertime, when the trees got full leaves, producing a lot of sugar, <coughs> the sugars get funneled down to the fungus. The fungus leaves the tree root. It's called an extra radical mycelium now. And it goes out into the substrate from the tree root. And it can go up to the surface and form a mushroom. Or it can go find another tree root and feed that tree from the big tree that it just left or it can get attacked by a highwayman like a mycoheliotroph, like a monotropa. So there's all these different things that can happen once the mycelium leaves the tree root. But what we want to happen, we want it to come to the surface and make a mushroom, like the beautiful Redipolitis ornatopes, the ornate stock folder.
The beauty of fall weeds is really indisputable when they're fresh, right? When they first pop up in the world, they're beautiful. You see these beautiful things in the forest? And then you bring them to a table like this, to a conference like this, and they turn into a mass of mush and little wiggling maggots. That's really not too exciting to see, but it's the reality of the bolids. They're putrescent. Putrescent is one of my favorite words when I talk about bolids. Does that answer your question about <laughs> Did I say, was that more than two or three seconds? Yeah, it just flew by. So tell me what kind of bolides you guys like. Who, who finds bolides edulous? What is Bolita's edulis? Anyway, what species? exactly is that? It's a European species from southern Sweden. Yeah, so... Do we have it here? Yes. I have no idea. I can't answer that question, and I don't know who can answer that question, but in the beginning, in 1783, uh, a mycologist came up with this idea that there should be a perfect model for all the Bolides. And so they named the European Boletus edulis as the type species for the genus Boletus. So that type is supposed to be the model upon which all the other Boletes are based, and it's supposed to conform to those basic ideas, but that never really worked. So about 1821, we had uh, Lucinum and Swillis named. So they're really distinct by the decorations on their stipes. Swillis has the resin dots, the sinum has the scabers, the little scabers or scabs all over the stem. That kept happening until we ended up with about 16 or 17 different groups or genera of bolides. And then came the nucleotide apocalypse uh, that, brought, that Roy Holland describes that so well. We started changing the way we, we use taxonomy from a taxonomy of phenotypes, the expression of a genetic type to a taxonomy of genotypes. And today, what we do in taxonomy, modern taxonomy, is a taxonomy of genotypes, the genetic evidence in any kind of classification decision is really weighted very, very heavily now. All the new classifications that you see, they take the weight of genetic or molecular inform information and they give that a lot of significance. We still want to give significance to the morphological evidence and the ecological evidence and the chemical evidence, but right now we're in a period in the history of classification where molecular evidence is ruling the day in terms of how we classify fungi. What I want to say is all your old names are still good. You can use Boletus. Don't be afraid to use Boletus. If somebody wags your finger at you and they say, that's butchery Boletus now, you can say, that's fine. I like Boletus. And you can still use Boletus. It's a valid synonym. It's just a name. All we want to do is give a name to these things. And you know, I could go on for hours and hours, but there's other people that probably want to talk. Does anybody have a question before uh, I abandon you all to this pile? Could you, could you briefly, if it's possible, uh, comment on the Monotropa uh, Association and how that relates to uh, mutualistic uh, mycorrhizal association? I'm happy to talk about Monotropa or Mycoheliotropes. It doesn't have anything to do with bullies, but that's all right. So. What we're talking about is ectomycorrhizal fungi, where you have a, a mycelium that's colonized the tree root. And when it colonizes the tree root, and then it goes back out into the soil, the mycelium spreads through the soil from the tree root, that's a two-way street. The mycelium can gather water and nutrients and give it to the tree. And so materials run from mycelium to the tree root. The tree, if it wants to, or if the mushroom needs it, can produce sugars in the leaves, and those sugars travel down the tree to the root and feed the mycelium. So you have this two-lane highway, right? The mycelial two-lane ectomycorrhizal highway, where materials can flow in two different directions like this, and then this plant comes along. This plant, monotropa, or Indian pipe, or pine sap, or a dozen other microheliotropic plants. And they say, 
wow, there's this big highway full of sugar. And so they attach their roots to the highway, to the mycelium, and they steal the sugar from the fungus that is getting the sugar from the tree. So it's like the highwaymen. They're in ambush, and then they're taking the sugar away. They call it a mycelium trope. They used to think it was a parasitic plant. And uh, it's really a fascinating relationship. As far as anybody knows, the Indian pipe doesn't give anything to either the fungus or the tree. It's just stealing the whole thing. Does it look like it's a collector mycorrhiza of the male and the heart of the and all that? Yep. Stuff? So it's basically Yeah, actually, the, the mycorrhizal association of the monotrope is a hard tangle of knots around the mycelium of, in this case, Rusula, rabbit beans. Anybody have a bully question for me? All right, we're, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you.